close right now. This is Contacts and Continuities, 500 Years of Asian Iberian Encounters, an international conference online hosted by Ateneo de Manila University in collaboration with CHAM, Centro de Humanidades, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, and the National Quinceanilla Committee of the Republic of the Philippines. It is now 5.30 p.m. local time, a rainy afternoon from Manila. We are live streaming on the conference YouTube channel and the National Quinceanilla Committee Facebook page. Greetings to our participants in the Zoom room and to our viewers on social media. The Department of Filipino is happy to host today's panel. We are all happy to participate in this month-long conference series. The conference has four parts, and we are currently in part four on legacies of the encounter in forms of expression, and this is the second half of the 17th panel. I am Andrea Antrinidad, and I will be your moderator for today's panel on cultural flows and reinventions, second part. For the next 90 minutes, we will have presentations from three speakers, followed by an open forum for about 20 to 30 minutes. We will entertain questions from three audiences here in the Zoom room, from the YouTube comment section, and from Facebook. Our community managers will monitor those channels and relay questions to us. I invite our viewers to please type your questions or comments, and we'll gather them and read them out for you later. Let me introduce to you our first speaker, Dr. Maria Patricia Brillante Silvestre, who is joining us from Manila today. Maria Patricia Brillante Silvestre is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Musicology, College of Music, University of the Philippines. With degrees in Musicology, Spanish, Diploma Basico de Español como Lengua Extranjera, and Philippine Studies, she merges her interdisciplinary interest in her research, which examines music, culture, time and place through the lenses of musicology, social history, language and literature, and cultural studies. She has done research, fieldwork, and presentation for the Smithsonian Institution's Pahias Folklife Festival for the 1998 Centennial Celebration of Philippine Independence and the International Music Council, among others. She has also written on diverse aspects of music in colonial and contemporary Manila, the Hispanic imprint on Philippine music, the colonial press and music journalism, identity and nation in music, which have been included in Quiapo, Heart of Manila in 2006, the life and works of Marcelo Adonai, which in 2009 had received a National Book Award, Philippine Modernities, Music, Performing Arts and Language from 1880 to 1941 in 2017. Saisai Himi, a source book on Philippine music from 1880 to 1941 in 2018. And in the journals Musica, Diagonal, and Pero Verde, and the Cultural Center of the Philippines Encyclopedia of Philippine Art in 1994 and in 2018. On the creative and performance side, Pat was formerly with the Philippine Madrigal Singers, with whom she has concretized both here and abroad. She was also a founding member of AWIC, Vocal Chamber Ensemble, specializing in Asian contemporary vocal art music, was keyboardist for musical theater groups, and has curated, annotated, and written for various performances. Everyone, let us now give our virtual applause to Dr. Maria Patricia Brillante Silves. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me share my screen now. There. Is it there? <laughs> In the news, Teatro Filipino, Artista Filipino, Filipina, Piano Filipino, Semantic Birthings of a Nascent Identity in Music. I'd like to begin my presentation with a very, very brief background of the press in the Philippines for an, for an idea of how newspapers evolved to become fertile material for, for my work. 
from its beginnings in the 16th century as an enterprise of evangelic labor, the colonial instrument of governance, to the very first real newspaper in 1811, to the mass-produced commercial periodical, to eventually instrument of revolution, the newspaper in the Spanish period lived a precarious yet colorful and prolific life due to censorship and other factors. Manila's first daily newspaper, La Esperanza, in 1846, started a wave of demand for news that would spur the rise of presses and periodicals and the newspaper reading public. The complexion of ownership of these presses and newspapers dictated the tone of the writings. Many were frankly Spanish, at times with Orientalist overtones, staffed by peninsulares and criollos, like Ilustración Filipina and Del Oriente in the 1860s to 70s. Some were quite liberal, like La Oceania Española in the 1870s, whose fortune it was to be edited by the respected, broad-minded Basque, Jose Felipe del Pan, who mentored native Filipino writers, one of which was Isabella de los Reyes. And a handful were pro-Filipino, such as the native newspapers El Pasig in 1862, Diaryong Tagalog in 1882, and La Lectura Popular, which addressed a growing vernacular readership, and the progressive La Ilustración Filipina in the, in the 1890s, which encouraged articles by natives and featured Indio and Mestizo artists. By and large, it may be said that through journalism, as through the galleon trade early on, the Philippines was thrust into the circuit of the modern world. Now, in the regular newspaper, which I uh, looked at, music as journalistic material took many forms and occupied both big and small spaces where it served many purposes. As you can see on the list on, on the left, and it's all there. Um, in the newspaper, too, were seen diverse ads. That's on the list on the right, um, um, different kinds of ads. There were also opera libretto serializations such as Aida and Lucia de la Mermur in La Oceania Española. Um, these newspapers provided the initial models of writing on music, criticism, histories, aesthetic discussions in the Philippine press, which would engender a body of writings by natives in the late 19th century. In all this journalism on music, a burgeoning local identity would be forged in print, that of becoming Filipino, as musicians and theater artists engaged the Western and the global through their native core, activating a transformative and synergistic process of positioning as a people responding to the uniquely potent brew of social cultural circumstances brought on by the inherently skewed and imbalanced colonial relationships in their time. At this point, in the last decade of the 19th century, I note a striking shift in the use of the name Filipino, as read in the papers in the texts of this study, that is from its Western geographic denotation of just a colonized native of Filipinas and its derogatory labeling of the Criollo to a distinct community of people that now encompassed Criollo, Mestizo, and Indio. Offspring of the turbulent complex conditions of colonization, and enabled by a mutual realization of a common past and destiny, these groups of people were in the process of building an identity that was forged and patented through shared experiences of struggle and oppression. Music and theater were important channels for expressing this. Hence, I share three examples among many others as pivotal in this shift of consciousness, capturing in print the semantic birthings of a nascent identity in music as Filipinos. So here's my first example, Comedia as Teatro Filipino. The theater form Comedia was first introduced into the colony in 1598. There was a lot about the Comedia earlier in the panel this morning. It became immensely popular, spread to other provinces, and became an urban entertainment in Manila's theaters, along with the Zarzuela in the mid 19th century. Um, developed by the 16th century Spanish Baroque poet Lope de Vega as a national dramatic form, the Comedia, as defined by Spanish dramatists, was a three-act play in verse. Um, the definition is there. Um, in the Philippines, Nicanor Tiongson describes it as a play in verse with conventions of stylized delivery, marching for entrances and exits, choreographed fighting, and very often artifices to create magical effects on stage. There were three types. Comedia de Capa y Espada, which was the rarest and which was uh, the very first uh, kind that was performed on, um, on uh, real events. There are examples for each. The Comedia de Santo on the lives of saints and biblical figures and 
the Commedia Fantasia on the lives and loves of royal characters spiced up by the conflict between Moors and Christians in medieval European and Middle Eastern kingdoms, as well as the battling of beasts and monsters. And this third type was what became um, the most popular kind in Manila and in the Philippines. Vernacularized versions among the lowland language groups soon sprouted as indigenized creations with a hybrid aesthetic. And um, there's a list there uh, of, um, of the names of comedia in the different places in the Philippines. And I also have here some examples of native comedia staged in Manila titles. At its peak in the 1870s to 1880s, however, the Tagalog comedia soon earned the ire of critics mostly Spanish writers who saw in the native type a bastardization and deterioration of the form, which had been classically molded by the great Lope de Vega. It promoted an, an ignorant unreality, was unwieldy and pompous, vulgar, primitive, irrelevant, and devoid of artistry. The newspapers chronicled all this biting criticism, not to mention that of other writers mentioned earlier, such as Barrantes, uh, Alvarez Guerra, uh, and Dentrala, and, and others. Um, in La Ilustración del Oriente, the comedia was described as una mentira or a lie and its world as a fandango. And this is very interesting because apparently an alternate colloquial meaning of fandango existed, which means un jaleo, a ruckus, or a foolish useless act, or a big fuss to refer to the form senseless and artificial excess. In the same newspaper, the writer Jose Alvarez Sierra denounced the comedia as stuck in its nappies. While in La Ilustración Filipina, um, Juan Ataide de decried these native productions as Dramones Tagalos. And an anonymous writer expressed his desire to see the cultured capital Manila rid of the comedia with its Moro Christian battles, which sensationalized golpes y choques, or blows and clashes, delivered by characters in capricious attire. A movement to promote the more realistic zarzuela emerged. For in the eyes and ears of these Spanish writers, the comedia had degenerated into an intolerable form of popular idiosyncratic Indio entertainment. Now fusing native sensibilities, temperament, and aesthetics, it used the Tagalog Kumintang, the Kundiman, the war dance, and the, the, the Himno de Riego in the fight scenes, which Spanish writers found incomprehensible. It was a mishmash of translated portions from various metrical romances. It improvised dialogue, presented vulgar acts, and sensationalized the character of the Pusong, who more often than not turned entertainingly subversive. The music was an assorted mix of seemingly ill-fitting pieces played by a motley band, and the venues ranged from town plazas to cockpits to theaters. In 1890, a native writer, Isabella de los Reyes from Ilocos province in the north took up the cudgels for the embattled form. Working in Manila, Isabella wrote a front page, two-part bilingual series in Spanish and Tagalog titled La Dramatica Filipina in La Lectura Popular. It was a conscientious critique of the Tagalog comedia, which assessed its moral and educational values, as well as admitted room for improvement. In the first series, he cites its flaws as follows in, in the excerpt you see at the bottom of uh, the first issue, uh, which uh, in general tells us that uh, the comedia was a, was a culturally a, an unintelligible form with no edifying value. In the second series, he calls on the Indio as agent of change, whose natural talent for music, a cultural trademark long since acknowledged by the earliest Spanish missionaries, was the key towards betterment of the comedia. As he proudly put it, the comedia would soon see better days because, quote unquote, todo indio es músico por inclinación. Okay, all indios are musicians by inclination, thus giving the musician a wider responsibility and music primary importance. Looking at the translation of the Spanish texts to Tagalog, one realizes a shift in semantics. Todo indio es músico translates to lahat ng Tagalog ay músico. El Teatro Filipino translates to Ang Teatrong Tagalog, and the title of the series itself, Ang Comedia Ang Tagalog, translates to La Dramatica Filipina. Tagalog was certainly Indio of native Malay descent and the main ethnolinguistic group in Manila and its environs. But surprisingly, the language was not confined to these areas, for it was understood even as far as Camarines in the Bicol region and in the islands not adjoining Luzon. 
Isabella qualifies Indio as Tagalog perhaps because the Comedia saw its first vernacularization and first local artistic deepening in Tagalog in Francisco Baltazar's hands. But he broadens Tagalog's reach by applying the term to all natives from Luzon to the Visayas. Filipino for him did not exclude race or class. It was both Igorot and Ilustrado. Through the Comedia, the homogeneous mass now as, of Indios, now as Tagalog and ultimately as Filipino, laid claim to an ethnic nationalist stance that expressed identity. And writing in Tagalog alongside Spanish in La Lectura Popular, Isabella contributed to what Mujeres calls the amplification of Tagalog. Its dissemination through print and distribution as commodity in regions outside of Manila and Tagalog speaking lands. The discussion on the Tagalog Comedia through the years in the newspapers, whether as diatribe or exaltation, all but succeeded in nourishing a popular consciousness of what it was and wasn't. It was Isabella's passionate journalistic activity in, in defense of the form as Filipino in all its confounding hybridity that sealed its identity in print, even as it gasped for breath at the turn of the century to eventually bow down to the sarsuela. My second example, Praxedes Yeyeng Fernandez, Artista Filipina. On the front page of La Ilustración Filipina, the image of the famous Mestiza Sarzuelista, Yeyeng Fernandez is seen with a proud caption, Aplaudida Artista Filipina, and with a column inside on her life and achievements under the heading, Nuestros Artistas, or Our Artists. Yeyeng, as she was fondly called, hailed from Santa Cruz, Manila, and began her career at age seven with the Compañía Infantil, dancing the Jota and Pandango, and eventually excelling in short comic songs with dance as a teen. Soon, under the wings of Spanish theater stalwarts Juan Barbero and Alejandro Cubero, who honed the talents of many promising native singers and actors, Yeyeng would evolve into the first comic soprano of Zarzuela in the Philippines. From then, she would soon form her own company with fellow native Zarzuelistas, perform all over Manila and in the Visayas, and even overseas in Hong Kong and Macau, and always to heavy applause and numerous encores. She starred in countless zarzuelas. There's a list over there um, on the left and appeared not to have really crossed over into opera despite its popularity in Manila, though she certainly may have sung arias from these. She was the embodiment of the native's dreams, fitted, admired, and enabled through music to rise from obscurity and cut through social hierarchies in a colonial society. The Spanish army even gifted her with a specially commissioned piece, a march titled Yeying. Her demise due to cholera in 1919 was commemorated by Manila's most eminent musicians at a grand program in her honor at the Teatro Zorilla. Certainly a profit drawer, the newspapers were quick to feature Yeying. The Manililia had this to say about her then at her peak. To write the life story of this charming artist is almost equal to writing the history of Filipino theater and es indiscutiblemente la primera actriz filipina que hemos conocida. Um, the seeds of the Filipino zarzuela had been planted in her heyday as the 1890s show zarzuelas, which although written by Spaniards, already showcased local customs. The women's periodical El Bello Sexo had this to say about Yeyeng with her image in one of her roles. As uh, la primera actriz dramática de Filipinas or the Philippines' first dramatic actress and the most brilliant star of Filipino theater. And the article was located in a prominent space under the heading Nuestras Actrices. The use of this possessive embracing pronoun, ours, marked at this historic point, the becoming of the Filipino as a people and in their evolving art form, the zarzuela as teatro Filipino, which would come into full swing by the early decades of the 20th century. My third and last example, Piano Filipino. From the 1870s, when the first pianos from Europe entered the Philippines, a thriving piano market of various imported brands began to grow, such that by the mid-1890s, there were about 55 different registered brands for sale in Manila's shops. And uh, you can see the list of shops there on the screen. Regular piano ads were often on the front pages, such as seen in El Comercio and La Ofenia Española, enticing readers with attractive payment schemes endorsements from piano virtuosos, and assurances of weatherproofing to fit the hot and humid Philippine tropical climate. 
The choice location of these piano ads, along with those of band instruments, music tutorials, and sheet music, attested to the support of church and state to music and art befitting native abilities, and which played a functional and supposedly politically benign role in society's affairs, much like drawing or dance. Manila was now a highly lucrative city for music and its commerce, and this emanated from the early musical training received by natives from the two main colonial institutions, the church and the military regiment. Thus, a thriving piano culture was in place in Manila at this time. A rising native middle class, which invested in pianos and lessons and attended concerts, ensured the propagation of this piano culture. Tastes were changing and evolving, as noted in the newspapers. The piano had become symbolic of cultural capital, part of the economy of cultural goods in a bourgeois revolution that included music. It had become the favored domestic instrument in regular households, connoting urban refinement, literacy, arts, and economic status. Its presence engendered a social space for convivial settings, reuniones, bailes, and tertulias. It was now a social necessity which reflected changing values as noted by Isabella de los Reyes again in his essay, La Enseñanza de la Musica en Filipinas, or the teaching of music in the Philippines. The newspaper was definitely instrumental in, in the development of this urban phenomenon for it bombarded the reader daily with piano advertisements. Lists of sheet music for sale gave readers an idea of the staggering range of repertoire that could be owned by a piano literate consumer, such as offered by Fonda Americana on Calle Palacio in Intramuros in La Ofenia Española. There you can see on, on the right, um, the list of categories of pieces. There were also uh, pieces for four hands and two hands, the obras a cuatro y a dos manos, and the repertoire for young pianists. Uh, to which titles uh, the label Muy Fácil was attached. For example, Rigoletto, Fantasia, Muy Fácil, or Very Easy. And all of this underscored the social values cultivated by piano music for all enthusiasts, whether amateur or expert. Furthermore, the newspapers published piano scores, providing free access to pieces by both Spaniards and Filipinos. And here we see um, El Bagon Tao, it's a polka by uh, Zalvidea y Guevara, Meditación Nocturno for Piano by Filamon Soto, and uh, one of Julio Nacpil's uh, Funeral Marches, uh, Sueño Terno in uh, La Ilustración Filipina. Manila in the 1890s had indeed entered into its golden age of piano music, as the critic Oscar Camps wrote in a review of the concert of a visiting pianist in El Comercio in 1895. And it was this flourishing piano culture that was the backdrop for the emergence of a piano Filipino. The piano as archetypal instrument of Western art music developed from the 18th century onwards by Italian, German, French, and American makers. And with a long rich history of repertoire created by Clementi, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt, Brahms, etc., now uniquely boasted a Southeast Asian identity that of the nascent Filipino. This identity in becoming sparked a recognition of a proud belonging to a community which cut through racial and social classes, as seen in the ad with the call to compatriotas, with an exclamation point, to buy locally made pianos by the mestizo piano maker Pio Trinidad in La Ilustración Filipina. In El, in El Comercio, a feature on Trinidad by the critic Oscar Camps, titled Da Capo, raised his efforts at developing local pianos after initially importing Swiss-made ones. At his Chiapo shop, he worked on using native wood for his pianos. Um, Acle, there's a, the, the names are there below. Acle for the casing, Dungon for the bridge, Calantas for the sounding board, which helped weatherproof the instrument against tropical conditions. Of special interest was his invention of a device called a tremolophone which when attached discreetly to the mechanism produced a smooth and distinct tremolo. Trinidad christened his local sound enhanced pianos, piano tubular or piano angelus, and the article praised him for this industrial breakthrough for the country's good, declaring that finally a piano Filipino was born. Two years later, again, a feature on Trinidad came out in the same newspaper, El Comercio, Una Fabrica de Pianos in Manila, which described the local pianos with uncluttered designs as having a hybrid system, which ensured precision and sound qualities that were unexpectedly superior. 
To conclude, from all this rich linguistic wordplay, one observes the shifts and fluctuations in the meaning of identity nomenclatures in music and use of embracing possessive pronouns to emphasize these shifts in this highly charged arena of the late 19th century. These may be read as positionings and negotiations leading towards the semantic birthing of the Filipino as a people through music brought on by a range of provocative social political factors and cultural circumstances like the bilinguality, racial mix, and enlightened outlook of Filipino writers, as well as Filipino readers who proudly identified with the music. From colonial tools at the onset, the newspaper evolved to be the Filipinos' own tool to dramatically carve out an identity in print through inclusivity fostered by the shared act of reading. From these three examples, I read forceful declarations through music and theater of identity in the act of coalescence. These communicated feelings of patriotism and ideology, pride of place, people, and community. Hybridity is concerned with degrees of cultural exchange, cross borrowings and inter intersections between race, class, gender, and ethnicity. Drawing on Homi Baba, hy hybridity finds realization through the act of mimicry, wherein replications necessarily involve a slippage or gap, which produces a third space, a dynamic area of negotiation and meaning. In these new spaces, the Tagalog Comedia, the Filipina Zarzuela Artist, and the Filipino Piano, power, strength, and persuasion are embodied. For these were certainly neither lapses or manifestations of vulnerability, nor failings of, of artistic originality, but rather were pungent anti-colonial critiques in themselves, areas in which the variegated processes of acclimating and reshaping the foreign to suit new contexts and native tastes were busily at work to produce creative and genuine expressions of a newly imagined nascent identity through music as seen in the regular newspaper. I'd like to leave you with a few bars from Medi Meditacion Nocturno by Filipino composer Filemon Soto, an exquisite piece of romantic pianism in the style of Schumann and Liszt, and it was the sole winner in a composition contest to commemorate the third death centenary of uh, San Juan de la Cruz, sponsored by the VOT de Nuestra Señora del Carmen de Manila, and it was published in La Ilustración Filipina. This piece and some others composed in the late 19th century are seen as having planted the seed for a Filipino art music tradition in piano to be nurtured and shaped later on in the 20th century with the rise of the University of the Philippines Conservatory of Music in Manila in 1916. And it isn't hard to imagine that it was played on a Filipino piano back then or a piano Filipino back then. I hope you enjoy this. Um... Okay, I think I need to stop there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Silvestre. Let us now proceed to our second speaker for this evening, Professor Margaret Sartishan, who is joining us from Massachusetts today. Margaret Sartishan is a professor of music at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. 
She completed her PhD at the University of Illinois Champaign Urbana in 1993 and is author of Cantiga de Padre Sechang, which comes with a CD and a booklet in, 1980, in 1998. The Albert Cookies Children Performing Tradition in Malaysia's Portuguese Settlement in 2000 and with Ted Solis, Living Ethnomusicology Paths and Practices in 2019. Her fieldwork and research interests lie in the city of Melaka, Malaysia, where she works primarily with the Portuguese and Straits Chinese Babanyonya communities. When in, Mala when in Melaka, she plays accordion with the 1511 O Maliao Maliao Cultural Tree. Our second speaker this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Margaret Sartisha. Thank you, Noel Rodriguez, for inviting me to participate. I'm going to share my screen now. The image in this slide will probably be familiar to many. I'm sure we've all seen cultural shows with smiling Asian bodies in Iberian costumes twirling effortlessly under hot stage lights. The theme of this conference, Contacts and Continuities, has given me an opportunity to use a different lens to reflect on 30 plus years of research on music and dance in the Portuguese settlement of Malacca, Malaysia. As I thought about Father Javeliano's spin on the theme, Contacts lead to connections which give rise to continuities, a more dynamic image came to mind, a pebble thrown into a small still pond. The pebble, literally a foreign object, creates an initial disturbance on the surface of the pond, the contact. That causes ripples to spread outwards and perhaps wash back the connections, until eventually the pond returns to a new point of equilibrium, the continuities. My focus is on the pond itself, the Portuguese settlement community. My first pebble is Father Antonio de Silva Rego. He was a Portuguese scholar priest who came to Malacca around 1935 or 6 and stayed for three or four years. His mission was to study the descendants of Malacca's first colonizers, the Portuguese, who had arrived in 1511. They ceded the city to the Dutch in 1641, who in turn gave it to the British in 1824. By the time Father Rego arrived, there was a clear division between upper-class Eurasians, largely English-educated, and the Portuguese, mostly fisherfolk. The latter were just starting to move into a new village called the Portuguese Settlement. Father Rego was particularly interested in the Malacca Portuguese language, Cristang, so he collected stories and oral poetry from elderly speakers. Their poetry took the form of song duels in which four line verses called Mata Cantiga were exchanged by pairs of singers, ideally a man and a woman. Couples would take turns to tease or flirt with each other for a verse or two to the accompaniment of brand new dance music. This was the most popular entertainment at social events, especially weddings. This old photograph gives us a glimpse into that world. Four ladies are wearing long blouses called cabaya comprido over sounds. Their blouses are not the short everyday cabayas, suggesting that these ladies are dressed for a party, perhaps a wedding. Two of them are musicians. One holds a gong, the other a violin. Add a large drum and we have a common instrumental combination shared with their Malay neighbours. In fact, there was a good deal of crossover between Malay and local Portuguese culture. For example, four-line quatrains sung in Kristan were called Mata Cantiga. Changed the language to Malay and they were called Pantuns. The same went for melodies. Branyo melodies could easily segue into Malay joggets because the rhythms and dance steps were the same. Although we don't have recordings from Father Rego's time, this session, recorded by Alan Baxter in 1980, captures the spirit of old style Mata Cantiga. The singers, Auntie Rosil, one of Father Rego's sources in the 30s, and Stephen Tessera were one of the last couples to perform in this dueling style. <laughs> Senza si 
Father Rego's interest in language and oral poetry showed the local community that such material had intrinsic value and caused a ripple that inspired a 13-year-old altar boy called Horace Santa Maria. Reminiscing about those days, Horace told me that none of the old people who knew songs like Alabanda and Chimpinola could sing in tune, so Father Rego only got lyrics from them. He also noticed their linguistic fluidity, quote, they would sing just one verse of the melody. When they couldn't continue, they would go into Malay pantuns. Somebody would try to reply, but mostly they would use Malay." End quote. This experience opened Horace's eyes. He was a musician and a naturally talented linguist and went on to become a much beloved school teacher and in the 1950s, leader of the Tres Amigos, Malaysia's first hillbilly trio. One of their signature songs, Alabanda Istibanda, was the first Kristang song broadcast nationally. Its lyrics came from Father Rego's collection of Mata Cantiga, a collection that simply became known as Father Rego's Books, book and cause ripples that continued to spread for decades. My second pebble is Commander Manuel Maria Sarmento Rodriguez, Portuguese Minister for Overseas Territories. In 1952, he sailed around the world to visit Portuguese colonies and former territories. Although his time in Malacca was short, a couple of days at most, it was transformative. 1952 was a pivotal moment for upper-class Eurasians. British influence was starting to wane and Malayan independence was on the horizon. Suddenly it became fashionable for them to identify themselves as Portuguese, a term formerly reserved for the poorer fishing community. Samanto Rodriguez himself is primarily remembered as the honoree of the tea entertainment. Organized by upper-class Eurasians and staged at the Capitol Theatre on May 19, 1952. This single event sent long-lasting ripples into motion. Once again, Horace Santa Maria, now leader of the Tres Amigos and a celebrity with a regular show on Radio Malaya, is our eyewitness. Father Pintado wanted us to put on something for the minister, but no one could dance Portuguese dance, so he got books from, Port from Portugal for us to learn. Of course, he chose people from the upper ten to do the dances because they were the educated class. Ida de Silva and her husband Clement taught songs from the book in Portuguese, and somebody else taught us two dances, Tiruiru and Ovira, from Father Pintado's book. End quote. Both dances are still performed today. Now, even though the upper-class dancers lost interest after the minister's visit, the ripple continued. Arthur Santa Maria, one of the original dancers, and Horace's younger brother, formed a new dance group in the Portuguese settlement. Portuguese dance became a popular social activity for teenagers and led to several marriages between dancers. The dances began to be passed on like ripples from one generation of dancers' bodies to the next. By the mid-60s, settlement performers had begun to compose and choreograph their own dances in similar style, and Portuguese dance became a marker of cultural identity in the new nation, Malaysia. My third pebble is Father Augusto Sandin, a Portuguese priest originally sent to Portugal, sent to Singapore. Father Sandin was transferred to Malacca in 74, around the time that several Portuguese Eurasian white-collar families emigrated to Perth. He's remembered as a handsome man who rode a motorbike and connected quickly with young people. He spent more time in Malacca than either of my other pebbles, yet probably would have stayed longer but for his untimely death in a 1989 motorbike accident. Father Sendim sent new ripples in motion when he established a dance group called Rancho Folklorico San Pedro. He was helped by Christy Rodriguez, one of the dancers at the 52 Tea Entertainment and Arthur Santa Maria's regular dance partner. Over the next decade, Christy and Father Sandin visited Portugal several times to collect new songs and dances for their group. This newer repertory, with its faster tempos and more complicated choreographies, distinguished Rancho Folklorico San Pedro from other groups. Incidentally, this was the only group to use the term Rancho Folklorico as part of its name. Most of the other groups used the Cristan Tropa. Father Sendim also co-opted three young men who had previously danced with other settlement groups. One of them, Joe Lazaru, became the new group's leader. It turned out to be an inspired choice. Joe was a charismatic singer and musician and became the most famous personality in the Portuguese settlement. 
In later years, he was simply known as Papa Joe. There he is in the centre. Lazarou continued to direct Rancho Folklorico San Pedro until his death in 2018. Sadly, the group's distinctive repertory and choreography is no longer performed, even though some of the former dancers continue to dance with one of the current groups. New equilibriums. When I reached Malacca in 1990, Portuguese dance was a collective term for an eclectic mix of songs dances performed in cultural shows for tourists, for the government and for paying functions. The mix included dances and songs first learned for the 1952 tea entertainment, new songs written and choreographed locally, songs brought back from Macau, the new repertory associated with Father Sendin, and last but definitely not least, the Branho in both its choreographed and social dance forms. At that time, there was no deep knowledge of the Portuguese Rancho Folklorico tradition. The absence of regular connection to Portugal is crucial because it meant that the Portuguese settlement tradition could develop unencumbered by someone else's history. And Kim Holden provides a thorough account of that history in her book, Performing Folklore, Ranchos Folkloricos from Lisbon to New York. The expansion of social media in the 21st century has led to an explosion of new connections. Portuguese interest in Malacca exploded around 2011 with the 500th anniversary of Dalbuquerque's arrival. Two tunas, one from Coimbra, the other from Porto, even visited the Portuguese settlement as part of that anniversary. Facebook has facilitated links with other Asian Portuguese communities, notably Tugu in Jakarta and Timor-Leste. The first two Asian Portuguese community conferences were held in the Portuguese settlement in 2016 and 19, and a third is being planned for Goa. As the last living connections with Father Rego and Sarmento Rodriguez pass on, and even Father Sandin is a fading memory, their ripples continue to spread. As in a pond, the water eventually settles and equilibrium returns, yet it has changed. The pond has become a new biosphere in which old and new coexist. Returning to my original slide, we still see the same smiling Asian bodies in Iberian costumes twirl effortlessly under the hot stage lights but we are also starting to see creative combinations of old and new emerge. Here are three intriguing examples. First, rethinking dress. In 2014, a new group of veteran dancers was formed, 1511 or Malhau Malhau Portuguese Cultural Troupe. All had performed with other groups in their youth. Many had given up when they got married. Older and a little stouter, these veterans asked, why do we dance our brand new in Portuguese costume? the traditional dress of their grandparents and began experimenting with new costumes, cabaya comprido for the women and pajamas with straw hats, the fishermen's attire of the old days for the men. <laughs> I think you'll agree there's a, a certain excitement there. Now, at the 2015 Festa San Pedro, they tried something unprecedented, which I'll illustrate here using their performance of Tia Nica. This song, first learned for the 1952 entertainment, has become something of a signature tune. In an afternoon show for a small, mostly tourist audience, they performed in their usual Portuguese costume. <laughs> Now, 
Later, they danced in their new kabayas and pajamas for a crowd filled with community members. <laughs> Now, this was a huge hit and they've continued to wear kabayas and pajamas at subsequent San Festa San Pedro celebrations. But interestingly, when they perform away from the settlement, outside agencies, even national heritage NGOs, insist they wear Portuguese dress. Of course, this misses a significant point. Wearing kabayas and pajamas to perform Portuguese dance makes a clear statement of ownership. This tradition belongs to us now. Second, blurring boundaries. Two moments at the 2016 Festa San Pedro demonstrate new ways settlement groups are reclaiming their performance scape. The first occurred on the last night when community members come out to dance the night away. The regular fair of line dances, cha-chas, branios and oldies was interrupted when the band started playing Tiru Liru, one of the original dances from 1952. Like so many settlement musicians, the band members weave in and out of worlds. The singers, Omalia Malio leaders, Gerard de Costa and his wife Anne de Mello, a second generation Portuguese dancers whose parents danced with Arthur Santa Maria's group. <laughs> moment boundaries are blurred. A dance, only performed on stage, in costume, as part of a cultural show, has been reclaimed and reframed as a social dance for members of the community, many of whom were Portuguese dancers in their youth. Earlier the same day, other members of O Maliao Maliao did something equally unusual. They recreated Amata Cantiga's song duel. The singers are Martin Tessera, nephew of Stephen, who we heard earlier, sing with Auntie Rosil, and Sara Santa Maria, both community activists in their own ways. Martin is a political activist and Sara runs a Christian language program which includes a dance group for small children. Martin and Sara were accompanied by a pickup band led by Gerard de Costa with Alvin Fletcher on violin. <laughs> Time, boundaries are blurred in the other direction. What was once an informal social dance has been reframed as a staged performance. Verses collected by Father Rego are memorized in sequence rather than extemporized spontaneously. Whether this experiment will lead to a revival of Mata Kantiga as a song duel, only time will tell. Third, new shoots. My final example demonstrates the way that ripples continue to spread, amplified by the process of migration. In the early 70s, Arthur and Horace Santa Maria joined a wave of migrants to Perth. Their families and Australia-born descendants now form a thriving community that looks to Malacca, not Portugal, as home. 
Like ripples that wash back toward the center of a pond, they return frequently to Malacca, especially for the annual Festa San Pedro. Stephen Sequera is one of these migrants. A nephew of Horace and Arthur Santa Maria, he was 14 when his family emigrated. As adults, Steve and his brothers have formed a trio, the Tres Sequeras, to recreate Tres Amigos songs at Festa San Pedro. More recently, Steve composed a song called Follow Me to Fiesta San Pedro. His song takes us on a magical tour of Malacca town, passing all the famous tourist sites, the clock tower, Jonker Street, the Dutch Square, en route to a party at the Portuguese settlement. Steve sent a disc from Perth to Malacca and asked the O Malhau Malhau members to create an accompanying dance. According to lead dancer Marina Felix, we put all our steps inside, Tianica, Balapera, Branio, Cha Cha, Mambo, to create a joyful dance and expression of happiness. <laughs> was a big hit at the 2017 Festa San Pedro and remains popular. In addition to its infectious original melody, it has one other surprise, a short rap section that references the brand new tune GP Nona and Alabanda Istibanda. words started, the dancers switch from cha-cha moves to brand new steps before returning to the familiar dance patterns from their Portuguese dance repertory. It's clear that the dancers own but are no longer bound by the movements passed down from previous generations. They now feel free to mix and match as they please. As Marina Felix, one of those dancers, said, I don't want Portuguese dance, I want our own. The current generation of Portuguese settlement musicians and dancers, as well as their Australian, Malaysian, Portuguese compatriots, are now less concerned with issues of purity and preservation of tradition. The ripples continue to spread outwards and wash back, but new and unexpected equilibriums are emerging as musicians and dancers discover their own unique approaches to style and repertoire. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that engaging presentation, Professor Sarkishan. Now, on to our final speaker this evening, Dr. Michael M. Porosa, who is joining us from Manila and who will be delivering his talk in Philippines. Allow me to introduce him first. Michael M. Corosa, PhD, is a folk professor and the current chair of the Department of Filipino School of Humanities at Ineo de Manila University where he handles graduate and undergraduate courses in Filipino literature, creative writing poetry, and literary translation. Since 2012, he has held in this university the Reverend Horacio de la Costa, de la Costa SJ, and our professorial chair in history and humanities. A multi-awarded poet, essayist, literary translator, and editor, he received the Southeast Asia Right Award from the Royalty of Thailand in 2007 and the Ani Nang Dangan or Harvest of Honor Award from the National Commission for Culture and the Arts of the Republic of the Philippines in 2009. He has won eight major prizes for his poems, essays, and stories for children in the Don Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Literature. 
his studies on poetry in Filipino, the Philippine national language, and literary translation have appeared in reputable local and international publications. He received the Reverend Henry Lee Irwin S.J. Memorial Teacher Award for the Humanities from the Ateneo de Manila University in 2016. In 2019, the Commission on the Filipino Language proclaimed him as the Campion ng Wika or Language Champion in the fields of literature and translation. He is currently the chair of the Union ng Mga Manunilat sa Pilipinas, UMPIL, or Writers' Union of the Philippines, and the National Committee on Language and Translation Subcommission on Cultural Dissemination of the NCCA. Let us now give the virtual floor to Dr. Michael M. Coros. Magandang gabi po. Good evening. Um, thanks for inviting me here. This is not the first time that I'll be delivering my talk in Filipino in an international conference. There was one conference that I attended before and one friend commented, uh, asked me, why do you have to deliver a lecture in Filipino? You're limiting your audience. But a good friend in Ateneo, a senior faculty, a mentor answered and said, no, you see, he is not limiting his audience he is actually expanding the audience of Filipino. <laughs> so I'm really uh, I'm sorry for the for, for the foreigners uh, for, for the foreigner friends who will not be able to understand all what I'll be saying tonight but then some friends I'm sure will do the translation for you. Sir, do you want me to share the slides with English translation? Let, give me a signal when to share screen. Oh, yes. Uh, please take your DK. Thanks for the instant translation that you did. On Can you start this. now or not yet? Uh, I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll just start first. No? Uh, well, at least I can share with you something in English first before I deliver my lecture in Filipino. In this short presentation, I will discuss the first Balag Tasan in Spanish. El Recuerdo y el Olvido, Memory and Oblivion, by Jesus Balmori and Manuel Bernabe, as a text that demonstrates how the national Filipinos in the early 20th century appropriated the language of their former colonizer in their state of affairs in resisting American conquest. In naming their act as Balagtasan, which they could have simply called Junta Poetica, Pusta Poetica, Balmori and Bernabe did not just join the bandwagon in 1924. It was their way, and I insist, of identifying themselves with the poets in Tagalog and in the other Philippine languages in advocating or in advancing nationalistic ideas and interests. Pagaban masasabing hindi ko kulangin sa limang makapal na aklat ang mga salitang ugat na Espanyol na pumasok sa Tagalog at sa iba pang katutubong wika ng Pilipinas, hindi ko natutuhan, hindi natutuhan, kaya hindi naging wika ng higit na kanakraraming Pilipino ang wika. Laging iniuugnay lamang ito sa maliit ngunit makapangyarihang sektor ng lipunan. Ang mga elitista o mayamang ina po ng mga Espanyol, na tumayo, naghari, nagpayaman at nagpahirap sa kolonyal na Pilipinas sa mahabang panahon. Obserbasyon nga ni Florentino Rodao sa isang masaklaw na pag-aaral niya, no 1997, the identification of Spanish with the oligarchy in the Philippines symbolized the identification of all things Spanish with the rising social, societal problems in Philippine society. Sa kabilang banda, hindi may kakaila ng Espanyol ay naging wika naman ng mga naunang intelektual at reformistang Pilipino na sumuri at nagpanukala ng luna sa marawal na lagay ng bayan tungo sa pagtatamo ng kalayaan ng kalagitnaan hanggang sa pagtatapos ng siglo labinsyam at hanggang sa unang hati ng siglo dalawampu. Ang pinakamasigasig sa mga ilustradong ito ang nagsilbing tagapagsalita ng kanilang hanay at nagproklama ng mga pananaw at hangaring may pambansang saklaw. Sa pagtanaw nga ni Bibensio Jose sa isang Afganya, sinisipi ko, the most advanced among the illustrados, fired by their ideals and growing convictions of a political character, ventured as the intellectual spokesmen of the middle class, oftentimes equating their interests with those of the entire nation. 
ang paggigiit ng nagamitin ng wikang Espanyol sa buong panahon ng pananakop ng Amerika sa Pilipinas ay isang malay na kontra-kolonyal na hakbang ng edukado at intelektual na Pilipino sa bungad ng siglo dalawampo. Isang paghama kung hindi man ganap na pagkakamali ang ituring na tanda lamang ito ng pagtatagumpay ng pananakop ng mga Espanyol sa kanya. Kung napaglilingkod niya ang Espanyol sa pagsusulong ng kanyang karapatan at mga kapatid. Uh, Paumanhin na uh, Dr. Carosa, uh, maaari yes. po ba, kasi may, may tunog sa tabi mo, uh, electric fan ba? O... No, wala, wala siya. Actually, I don't know. It's coming from the, from the laptop. Maybe I don't know. I, I can't eliminate. Ah, ayan ho. O oh, sige ho, patuloy na. <laughs> Okay, salamat. Yes. No, they can lumalabas siya from time to time. Eh. Okay. Anyway, what, what, what am I now? Kung napaglilingkod ng Pilipino ang Espanyol sa pagsusulong ng kanyang karapatan at mga kapakanan, masasabing nagtagumpay siya sa pag-angking dito. Pagbidiin nga ni Florentino Rodao, nagkaroon di umano, nang di maipaliwanag na silbi ang wikang Espanyol sa Pilipinas. At sisipiin kong muli siya. It was the language of a colonial power, but it was used as an anti-colonial tool, a colonialist language with an anti-colonialist role. Sa ganitong konteksto, lumitaw ang unang balagtasan sa wikang Espanyol ni na Jesus Balmori at Manuel Bernabe, ang El Recuerdo y El Olvido, Dulita at Limot, noong 1924. Sa tingin ko, Isang hakbang ito na nagtanghal ng pagsisikap ng mga makatang Pilipino na isa katutubo ang pagtula sa wikang Espanyol. Hindi nasakop ng Espanyol ang Pilipino. Inangkina ng Pilipino ang Espanyol. Nikki, pwedeng pakiflash na natin yung quote from uh, Teodoro M. Calao. Pagmamalaki nga ni Teodoro M. Calao sa introduksyon ng aklat na pinagtampukan sa tatlong balagtasan ni Nabalmore at Bernabe, walang bayang iginagalang na tulad ng sa atin na may mataas na antas ng kakayahan sa pagbigkas, sa pagbigkas na pagpapahayag. Maaari tayong makatagpo tulad halimbawa sa hapon ng mga makata ng digma, pag-ibig, pag-unita, paglimot, pagtatakwil at kamatayan. Ngunit tayo, hindi lamang tayo mayroon ng mga ito. Mayroon tayong mga tagisang pampanitikan, mga tunay na tagisan ng dagli at masisisting pagtugon sa katunggali na parang naghahagkis ng balaraw na Florentina at tila espadang makinangang karikta ng panawagan at pangangatwiran. Isang tradisyong pabigkas na pagbabanyuhay ng isihigit na isang matandang tradisyong tinawag na duplo at karagatan ng mga Tagalog ang balagtasan ay pagtatalong patula ng dalawang makata. Ibinunga ito ng isang pulong ng mga kasapi ng Kapulungang Balagtas noong ikadalawamputwalo ng Marso 1924 sa layo ng higit na magkaroon ng maringal na pagdiriwang sa araw ni Francisco Balagtas ng taong iyon. Sinulat ni Patricio Dionisio ang kauna-unahan script nito na sadyang ginawa upang maging huwara ng sino mang interesadong makipagbalagtasan. Inalathala ito sa isyo ng bagong lipang kalabaw ng ikalaman ng Abril 1924. Naganap noong ika ng Abril 1924 sa Instituto de Mujeres ang unang pagharap ng mga makatang mambabalagtas. Sa anim na pares na nagtagisan ang parehang Jose Corazon de Jesus at Florentino Culiantes ang nakaakit ng lubos sa mga manonood. Naging napakapopular nito. Pangunahing matutukoy na sanhi ng ganitong katanyagan ang katangian ng balagtasan na nagsasangkot sa publiko sa isang pagpapasya Hinggil sa katwirang inilalatag ng mga mambabalagtas, ano pat ang mga makata mismo ay nagsilbing kinatawan at tagapagtaguyod ng magkabilang panig ng usaping pinagtatalunan. Ang pagkakaroon ng balagtasan sa Espanyol ay nagbigay diin sa lak lakas ng katutubong wika. Para kay Galileo Safra, isa itong ekstensyon na lamang ng popularidad ng anyo. Ngunit, ibig kong igiit, na higit sa, na dapat makita ang nasabing pangyayari bilang paraan ng pag-angkin ng katutubo sa banyagang wika. 
isang pag-aangkop ito ng Espanyol sa may pinag-ugatang tradisyong pabigkas ng Pilipinas. Para kay Estanislao Alinea, ang balagtasan sa wikang Espanyol ang ikatlong sanhi kung bakit may tuturing na ginintuang panahon ng panitikan sa wikang Espanyol sa Pilipinas ang mga taong 1903 hanggang 1942. Sa tingin pa niya, isang pagpapalawig ito ng requesta poetika ng panitikang Espanyol at naging popular noong edad media. Gayunman, siya na rin ang umamin na kakaiba ito sapagkat dito sa balagtasan ipinaliliwanag nyo na ang tema bago magsagupaan o magsalitan sa pangangatwiran ang dalawang makata. Ibinagdag pa niya na ang madla ang gumaganap na tagahatol sa pamamagitan ng palakpakan. Ipinapatong ng direktor o presentador na kinikilala sa Tagalog bilang lakandiwa ang kanyang kamay sa ulo ng bawat makata. Ang makatang palakpakan ang pinakamalakas ng madla ang indinideklarang nagwagi. Sa una nilang pagharap, higit na malakas ang palakpak na ginawad kay Bernabe kaysa kay Balmori. Sa mga sumunod na labanan, naghalinghina ng dalawa sa pagbihag sa palakpak ng mga manonood. Sa unang tingin, maaaring ituring na isang pagsakay lamang ni Balmori at Bernabe sa katanyagan ng balagtasan ng Tagalog noong 1924 ang pagpapasimula nila ng ganito ring gawain sa Espanyol. Bagaman pwedeng tawagin husta poetika, ang tipunin nila sa isang aklat ang kanilang tatlong balagtasan ng, ng tipunin nila sa isang aklat ang kanilang balagtasan noong 1927, balagtasan, husta poetika pa rin ang itinawag nila. Sa ganang akin, dapat makita ang pagtawag ng balagtasan ni Balmore at Bernabe sa kanilang pagtatalong patula sa Espanyol birang paraan ng pakikiisa nila sa mga makata sa wikang Tagalog sa kawaing makabansa at mapagpalaya. Pinatutunayan ito ng nalathalang teksto ng kanilang balagtasan. Sa balagtasan ito, pinanigan ni Balmori ang gunita, recuerdo, at si Bernabe naman ang nagtanggol sa olvido, paglimot, paglimot. Sa una hanggang ikatlong tindig, uminog ang pagtatalo sa pagunita at paglimot ng pag-ibig. Sa ikapat at ikalimang tindig, nauwi ang pagtatalo sa usapin ng paggunita at paglimot sa himagsikang Pilipino at sa mga martir ng bayan. Sa unang tindig ni Balmori, inilarawan niya ang sarili sa tinig na patalastas na isang maginong mandirigma na marami ng pinagtagumpayang labanan. Ganito po ito. Uh, you will, makikita ninyo yung quotes, yung mga saknong in Spanish with the translation of Nikki in to English. But I will be reading my translation in Filipino. Now, what's the point? I would like you to see that even if these poets wrote or performed their balagtasan in Spanish, they were actually Tagalog. So you, so that means even if the language used was Spanish, they can be heard as Tagalog. This is how it goes. So sa unang tindig ni Balmori, Inalarawan niya ang sarili sa tinig na patalastas na isang maginong mandarigma na marami ng pinagtagumpayang labanan. Sabi niya, Paksakoy gunita ang aking palayaw pagkamaginoo sa gisag ko'y laurel baluti sa dibdib ay malaking bato. Ang pakpak na puting panulat ng tulang na sa aking noo na naspa sa taas ng agilang ginto nitong aking kasko. Bilang tugon sa tindig, sa tinig na panambitan, nagpakilala si Bernabe bilang isang payak na taganayon. Kung gaano kataas ang tinig ni Balmori sa pagpapakilala ng kanyang kadakilaan, mapagpakumbaba namang inilarawan ni Bernabe ang kanyang sarili. Next slide, please. Ginoong makata, kayo ang prinsipe ng tugma at sukat, ang karwahe ninyo'y Gintong ang dakilang arawang may tulak. Gumagapang ako sa lupa, sa rurok kayo'y kumikislap. Yaring aking noo ay hubad ang inyong ulo ay masinag. Umiilaw kayo sa parke sa sukal ako'y umaandap. Inaawit ninyo'y dangal ang sa akin ang bertod na payak. Tigib sa paggunita ng masasayang araw ng kabataan at pag-ibig ang ikalawang tindig ni Balmori. Inilalarawan niya rito ang dagat ermita at ang baybayin nito na naging saksi sa kanyang paglaki at pakikipag-ibigan. Pa 
para kay Balmori, ang lahat ng kanyang karanasan mulang pagkabata hanggang sa tumanda ay bahagi ng kanyang gunita na sanhi at bukal ng kanyang pagkula. Kaya nga, iginiip niya. Dakilang makata ang naghahamon mong salitay tantuin. Isang kulay lamang sa paleta nitong abang buhay natin. Sapagkat kung iyong nalimutan yaong una mong paggiliw, ikay walang puso't hindi ka makata na maituturing. Isang kwento tungkol sa nabigong pag-ibig ang itinugo ni Bernardo. Isinalaysay niya ang pakikipag-ibigan niya sa isang dalagang bukod tangi ang ganda, si Paz na may mata ng gabing karinlan at may kaluluwang walang bahid kahalayan. Iniwan niya si Paz nang magtungo siya sa lungsod upang mag-aral sa kolehiyo. Araw-gabing ginugunita niya ang pag-ibig nila ni Paz. Ngunit nang magbalik siya sa kanyang nayon, sumalubong na ang lahat sa kanya maliban kay Paz. Yun pala, ayon sa pagtatapat ng kanyang ina, sumama na sa ibang lalaki si Paz. Dahil sa kasawi ang dinanas niya, iginiit ni Bernabe ang halaga ng paglimot. Aniya, magmula nga noon ako'y naglalakbay ang hinahanap ko ay ang kalungkutan. Kalungkutan, kalungkutay yaong gunitang naparam, gunitang naparam ang kapayapaan, ang lungkot, payapat, limot ang aakay sa akin patungo sa kawalang hanggan. Pagkat mga ito, sa aking nalaman, ang tunay na buhay at katotohanan. Sa ikatlong tindig, binigyan ni Balmori ng matalinghagang depenisyon ng pag-ibig, wika niya. Pag-ibig ay isang sugat na mapula at napakaantak at sa buhay nati nag-iiwan ito ng maraming bakas. Mapaghilo mo man ang kailaking sugat ng iyong pagliyag, may pilat na laging magpapagunita ng dati mong sugat. Para kay Balmori, may malaking ugnayan ng gunita at pag-ibig. Umiibig tayo dahil may gunita. Gumugunita tayo dahil may pag-ibig. Tulad ng pag-ibig na paiinog ng gunita ang daigdig. Kung bakit tayo narito at kung bakit naghahangad pa tayo ng bukas ay dahil may ganitong nagsisilbing inspirasyon at gabay sa kasalukuyan. Ang mariing tugo naman ni Bernabe ay ganito. Malupit na Panginoon at berdugo ang gunita na sa ating naggagapos sa lagay na mapandusta. Ang paglimot ay pagwasak sa pasaning mapangaba. Ang paglimot ay paglaya. Sa huling dalawang tindig ng dalawang makata, natuon sa usapin ang himagsika ng pagtatalo. Ganito ang naging marugdob na hamon ni Balmori kay Bernabe. Ginong Bernabe, kung pananaw nati hindi magkatugma, ang sinasabi ko'y kathang isip lamang sa iyong akala, maaari na ngang gutayin mo yaring huli kong gunita kung magagawa mong gutayin ang araw ng aking bandila. Ganito naman ang weltang higit na matindi ni Bernabe. Tulad ng bituing nasa kalawakan, bayani sa wika at mga paghakbang ang Torres Bugalyon ang yengkot lu naman maging bonifasyay, bonifasyay pawang nagdaraan. Ngunit ang gobyernong muling tatag lamang kapakanan nila'y kinaliligtaan. Mga mamamayang nilalapastangan sila na sa gisag nitong sambayanan. Dito ang pangalan ay natatandaan. Ngunit ang ginawa ay nalilimutan. Kung lalagunin, ang gunita para kay Balmori ay ang pag-iral ng buhay. Ito ang gabay ng tao sa patuloy na pagtahak niya sa buhay. Ito ang nagtutulak sa tao upang huwag maduwag na harapin ang mga hamon ng buhay. Para kay Bernabe, ang paglimot ay habag ng Diyos sa tao. Sa bisa ng iisang patak na paglimot, nawawala ang lahat ng pait na kanyang dinanas. Napakahalaga ng paksang ito ni Nabalmori at Bernabe. At may mahigit, may mahigpit na pagkakaugnay sa layunin sa pagtula at kontra-kolonialismong pagkilos ng mga tinatawag na balagtasista ni Virgilio Almario. Kung isasalig sa sinabi ni Franz Fanon, hinggil sa gunita ng lahi na binubura ng kolonialismo, naghahain ang gunita at paglimot sa madlang tagapakinig o mambabasa 
ng mga katwiran o kontra katwiran kung bakit dapat gunitain o kalimutan ang mga naganap sa kasaysayan ng bayan. Wika nga, hindi lo, ang hindi lumingon sa pinanggalingan, gaano man kaganda o kapangit ang pinanggalingan iyon, ay hindi makararating sa paroroonan. Ito ang halaga ng gunita at paggunita sa kontrakolonyalismong proyekto. Sa balagtasan ni Nabol Mori, nanalo ang panig ng paglimot ni Bernabe. Tila isang malaking kabalintunaan para sa kontekstong kanilang kinalalagyan na paniga ng madla ang paglimot kaysa gunita. Ngunit, bakit nga ba? Nasa masiste o parikala ng pagtula. Irony ni Bernabe ang susi para sa higit na pag-unawa. Gayun din naman, sa paggamit niya ng apostrofe, sinugatan niya ang madla ng hindi kinailangang tuwirang patamaan. Nahikayat niyang hindi kinailangang hikayati ng madla upang panigan siya kaysa kay Balmori. May pagpapalagay na sa mga taludtod na ito, naglulundo ang katwiran kung bakit siya sinangayunan ng madla. Next slide please. Pag-ibig, kariktan, kabutihang asal, punla ng paglingap sa sariling bayan, ay nangahuhubog sa kaibuturan ng pagkaingrato ng sangkatauhan. Ipinamukha ni Bernabe sa madla ang nangyayari sa kanilang panahon. Higit na namamayani ang paglimot kaysa paggunita. Nang isa-isahin niya ang tungkol sa mga bayani ng himagsika na nakalimutan sa mga taong naging tuntungan ng iba pang masenso, may himig na nang uuyam ang kanyang tinig. Sino si Natores Bugalyon at Yenko? Bakit sila itinabi sa pangalang Luna o Bonifacio? Isang magaling na militra- military strategist si Torres Bugalyon ng Salasa, Pangasinan. Pinagkatiwalaan siya ng husto ni Antonio Luna sa panahon ng digmaang Pilipino-Amerikano. Si Flaviano Yenko sa kabilang banda ay general revolusyonaryo na bayani sa labanan sa Salitran, Cavite noong 1897. Hindi sila gaanong sikat na bayani kung iahambing kina Luna at Bonifacio. Ngunit sikat man o hindi, pare-pareho silang nalilimutan ng bayan. Malinaw ang punto ni Bernabe. Higit pa sa paglimot ang hindi pagpapahalaga sa mga bayani ng bayan. Gamit ang parikala, Gamit ang parikala na sasabi ng hindi tuwira ng aral na nais makintal sa kamalayan ng madla. Malakas na dumarating ito na parang pang-uusig ng budhi. Masakit ngunit nakahihikayat. Malupit ngunit nakapagpapalubag. Didaktiko pa rin ngunit higit na nagpapaisip. Pansinin ang ganitong bisa ng saknong na ito ni Bernabe. Next slide. The last slide. Mga martir nitong lupang tinubuan, karangalan kayo ng aming nagdaan. Di kayo sumuko hanggat di matanaw ang pagliliwayway niyong katubusan. Sakaling mayroong ibang himagsikang hihingi ng dugo na maiaalay, magbabalik kayo at iwawagayway ang ating bandil at makikipaglaban at kayo ay muling kikitla ng buhay at kayo ay muling makakalimutan. Ang pagpanig kay Bernabe ng Madla ay pag-amin sa kanilang kasalanan. Ang kasalanan ng paglimot sa kanara- nakaraan. Paglimot sa responsibilidad ng sabihin ni Bernabe na ang paglimot ay paglaya. Isang malaking parikala ito sapagkat kung kalilimutan ng lahat, mahihinto ang lahat ng aktibidad at wala nang magpapatuloy o gagalaw. May pisa ng salamin ang sinabi ni Bernabe. Ang kabaligtaran ang nakita sa tinignan. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat po, Dr. Torosa. And thank you so much to our three speakers. It's now time for us to pose questions or comments about their presentations. I invite the conference participants in this Zoom room to please type in your questions in the chat box or raise your hand so I can call you in case you want to ask your question directly to our speakers. 
I'd like to acknowledge our team of community managers. The Ateneo organizers led by Noel Rodriguez is monitoring on YouTube, while Juvelin Mierdes from the National Historical Commission is monitoring the questions from the Facebook live stream on the National Centennial Community site. Okay. So I guess we already have a couple of questions from our social media pages for our first speaker, Dr. Silvestre. First is from VC Cord and it says, the municipality of Lope de Vega of Eastern Samar is named after the playwright. I wonder why the municipality was named after him. And the second part is from Rebecca Park saying here that seeing the 19th century Spanish newspapers is fascinating. I'm amazed at your methodology of examining these as primary source for your work. What led you to decide to use the newspaper as your main source? May I also ask why didn't you consider the revolutionary periodicals? This could have offered alternative perspectives. So that's a two-part question for our first speaker, Dr. Sylvester. Thank you for the, thank you for the questions. Um, I have really no idea, I'm sorry, about Eastern Samar and Lope de Vega, uh, the place being named that way, but it's very interesting to find out. I would like to know um, the reason why also you know, there, there could be something there that we are missing. Uh, um, now, the, the first question was, um, why the newspaper? Okay, well, uh, well, uh, uh, I, like, like everybody else, we all grew up with newspapers, but in my case, it was something different because I grew up with piles and piles of newspapers here in our home. My dad was a, is a writer and he maintained an archive of newspapers and he, uh, uh, if we messed with those newspapers or, or disposed of them, he would get mad. And so the piles were there and I grew up. Uh, seeing those piles, but then uh, it led me to certain to realize certain truths about the about the newspaper that it could be a window to uh, um, a lived existence. To use the words of uh, one of my mentors in musicology, Dr. Bill Summers, it can bring back the past. And uh, and uh, you know, I eventually found myself going back to those piles and uh, reliving the zeitgeist of uh, the '60s, the '70s the 1980s, and it was fascinating to read about people's lives and events. And then uh, eventually um, I uh, considered it as a cultural object, which when you view it in this way, it, it, the texts can you know, open up to you know, embedded uh, uh, um, meanings, alternate realities, um, um, imaginings of uh, people during that time. And, uh, and so I decided to use that as my primary source material. It is, uh, uh, it is uh, ordinary in the sense that it is cheap and um, uh, it is easily disposed of. But then in a sense, the newspaper is extraordinary because it is uh, a precious mirror of the times and uh, it is uh, the first draft of history, so to speak. Um, I, 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 can, I can recall one session um, at the Lopez Museum when I was looking at the, the archive there of newspapers and the, news, the, the librarian allowed me to touch the Diario de Manila for the first time when all of this time I was doing microfilm and it was a real treat for me to hold the paper itself. And, uh, and uh, uh, mm -hmm. I realized that real people actually held this issue in their hands in the 1880s and that gave me sort of a, some kind of goosebumps. <laughs> so that's it for the newspaper. And I think there's another question, um, the second one. Yeah, about using uh, more revolutionary periodicals. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I, I, I decided to, to, to focus on the, 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 reg, the regular the, the regular newspaper and not the revolutionary periodicals that were um, started that's that started to come out from uh, the 1880s onwards uh, due to certain limitations that were very real like uh, I could not really find complete copies of a lot of um, titles um, uh, uh, well we, we know that la solidaridad had to be smuggled in from Barcelona and uh, 
um, uh, there's no no copy today of uh, of the Kalayaan, the Katipunan's newspaper. Uh, uh, I was told that there there might have probably been a copy at the National Library before the bombing of Manila, but then um, we don't have any anything um, um, any issue to to look at also. Um, and also there were uh, the reason why it was difficult to, 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 to look at these materials was because uh, these papers belong to the clandestine press that kept moving. They had to keep moving so to evade arrest uh, and uh, or shut down. So I decided to go for the regular newspaper. Thank you so much, Dr. Silvestre. Welcome. While waiting questions from our Zoom participants, allow me first to read comments we have received from our viewers and we have a couple for Dr. Sarkisian's presentation. From Stefani Shavila Pilay, she says, your wonderful analysis of the music and dance of the MP, Margaret. And Colin Go agrees with Stephanie in saying, well presented, Margaret. Um, a couple of more comments from Ivan Chrissy Jeremiah. Thanks, Margaret, for that very interesting facts on Malacca, Portuguese cultural and musical background. And last one, I guess, is, a sh is an anecdote from Crystal Ray. I was accompanying Alan Baxter regularly that time during all his recordings. Um, in line, oh yes, would you like to say something about it, Professor Sartishan? Um, I, I couldn't quite hear um, who said that made that comment about accompanying Alan Baxter because my oh. internet connection froze for a second? It was Crystal Ray. Okay, okay. Um, thank you for sharing that. And it was also great to hear uh, from Dr. Stephanie and also Colin Go. And it was also a thrill for me to have both Martin Tessera and uh, Sara Santa Maria, who I mentioned, who were actually on the Zoom uh, presentation. So it was it was it was great to have them uh, watching this. So thank you, everybody, for your support. Thank you so much. We have a participant here on Zoom. He's raising his hand. May we call him now, Paolo Pirito. Would you like to say something? Hello, thank you. Well, I would like to, to make one or two comments and one or also one or two small questions to Margaret. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. This is quite fascinating for us here in Portugal listening about this because, you know, we have here in Portugal, we have quite um, some romantic ideas, stereotype ideas about the Portuguese of Malacca and even the, the newspaper and the media, they go to Malacca and they arrive writing pieces about how the Portuguese traditions are still alive in Malacca and how they still dance Portuguese dances, most of the time without the historical context and how these dances were actually introduced uh, in the in the in the 20th century it's quite interesting to and i'm always saying to them no 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 please just dig a little bit more about this because these are not 500 year traditions of portuguese dances you know it's some um, quite silly but and but just uh, the uh, the remark is i was in malacca in 92 and i mm -hmm. met uh, father uh, manuel pintado he was still alive <laughs> i haven't met him there <laughs> When, of course, I was a young student, I was also fascinated seeing uh, those dances, and he explained to me about that. Uh, and so my first question is, I didn't uh, listen, I didn't see uh, pa Father Manuel Pintado as one of the pebbles. You mentioned uh, uh, Rego, <clears throat> and then the other one. I don't know if he was really an important uh, uh, pebble, as you mentioned, or, or not. The second remark is, is to just to say how fascinating this is this, how the in the 21st centuries, the, the groups and the communities claim these dances as their own and no longer as a Portuguese tradition. I think it's, it's something very interesting how these things evolve and how these traditions change shape. And, 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 and the question is, you mentioned, I think, a community of uh, migrant of people of uh, diaspora people from Malacca that are now in Perth in Australia, and, and and I would like to ask you if you have knowledge of any other communities of the Portuguese of Malacca that went to other places mm -hmm. and have potentially developed their own traditions on dance. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Paolo. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot there and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, Father Pintado was very important. He was there from 1948 until, even though he retired, he stayed until I believe 1994 and then uh, passed away soon after that. He was very important and in the sort of longer version of this he was definitely one of the people that um, I would have focused on as pebbles. I had to keep cutting and cutting and cutting as I'm sure you understood to make a time limit but I felt the other three um, were um, sort of transformative in a different way um, and, and, and I did mention him uh, when we were talking about how that tradition came about in 1952, because I think if his presence had not been there, um, the, that dance would not have happened uh, in, in, in 52, because he was the one who got books and encouraged people um, to dance. Uh, I think the reason why I f focused on Sarmento Rodriguez was because he was the catalyst for that moment, um, and perhaps Father Pintado was the agent um, and I was trying to stick with that metaphor. And also, I think there was a class distinction in the way Father Pintado worked with uh, the, the upper class people and the community members that was um, could perhaps have been different in a, in, in a different era. Um, you also talked about the um, community in Perth. That's the largest one I know where people have gone to a single place. There are many, many, many people from Malacca who have emigrated, particularly a, a, a number did in, went in the 70s. There are pockets of a few people in England. There's a few people in America, a few people in Germany. But this is the only one where I would say there is a community where, with some coherence. Um, at some point, they've had a dance group. They have monthly gatherings there where they get together. Um, they have sing songs. Um, so, so, so there are moments there um, that I think this is the first sort of diaspora of a diaspora, if you, if you, if you will. Um, and then finally, the Portuguese dance aspect. Um, I think you make an excellent point, and that is when Portuguese people. Sorry, there's some banging going on here. When um, I hope that was nothing serious. Um, when Portuguese people um, um, come to Malacca, they see the dance and they see the connection um, and they, they kind of elide history um, from 1511 to the present. Um, and that's really, really fascinating. Um, and I think people in the Portuguese settlement would still call this Portuguese dance and they would still... Uh, they still are very proud that they do Portuguese dance. But what I was very interested in with the theme of this conference was trying to look at the way that there are continuities that are deeper than the Portuguese dance that overlaid all of this. And, and, and for me, with the community in this moment of real threat from land reclamation projects and um, that, that's going on, that's going to destroy the community, I fear, um, I wanted to say that there was something deeper that holds them together that I think is important and that nobody else really talks about because everybody gets seduced by the romantic um, um, side of the costumes and the dance and the connection back to Portugal. Um, I'd love to hear your opinion of that. Well, yes, of course, yeah, it's, it's, um, I, I, I'm not, well, I'm, I'm an historian, so I'm always focused on this, on the early periods, of course, but, but I have some contact, well, I, there's an anthropologist, uh, uh, Brian O'Neill, who has studied this, and there's yeah. a, a, cinema, a cinematographer, a Portuguese, Pedro Palma, uh, mm -hmm. he was a participant in one of the sessions we had a few weeks ago about, about this, and he has made some documentaries about the Portuguese settlement in, in, in Malacca, how it was in the 90s and, and how it is now. And the, the most recent uh, piece he produced, I think it's online, I can give you the, 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 the link. Mm -hmm. It's actually how the, the community feels threatened nowadays because of the, uh, the investments and all those buildings and all of that. And, and the relations of the material life and the cultural heritage is something well interesting and sometimes painful because we, would, we all would like to love to see the Portuguese settlements uh, 
frozen in time, you know, some sort of of, 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 of a touristic uh, landscape for us Portuguese to feel proud. And, but, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes a uh, reality goes on and the time goes on. It's, it's something interesting. But I, I have no, I have no uh, real knowledge about, about what is happening now. But I'm very interested is exactly on this diaspora inside the diaspora that mm -hmm. you have mentioned, how groups met, moved to, to other places and countries and how they developed their own traditions focused and rooted in Malacca and no longer and no longer on the Portugal and Portuguese. It's some sort of, of a matryoshka, you know, it's it's a, 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 a figure inside, yeah. inside. It's interesting. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. That's a great metaphor. That's a great metaphor. Thank you. All right. Before we proceed to a couple of questions addressed to Dr. Carosa, we would like to acknowledge the presence of Sara Santa Maria and Martin Pizera, who are part of Professor Sartesian's presentation. Perhaps they would want to say something in relation to the presentation that we have just witnessed and the engaging conversations that we're having so far. Uh, Martin, <coughs> Martin here. Um, I'm very, very, very interested uh, to know more about the evolution of the music that is found in Malacca. You see, <clears throat> many of our grandparents, in fact, came from the Philippines. You see, I give an example. My great grand, my my great grandfather was a Filipino, and the, the love for music started there. So I'm so glad that the music is still in our blood. So hopefully we can still continue this uh, music uh, passion of ours and continue to preserve it for the future generations. So uh, forums like this will encourage more people, more youngsters to slowly uh, love and appreciate their cultural heritage, especially in music and song and also dance. Yes, thank you. That's my comment. Well, um, for me, um, hi everyone. I have learned so much from um, today's talk uh, by Margaret. Okay, I have a dance troupe. So I'm, I myself am a dancer. I'm from the 1511 Umaliao dance troupe. So I, I was dancing, I started dancing at the age of 13 years old with um, Father Sandin's dance troupe. Can you hear me? Can yeah, I? Yeah. From the um, proper this San Pedro, uh, under the leadership of uh, Papa Joe, Joe Lazaro, and then I stopped dancing for a while, and then I joined back in with the 1511 dance troupe. And in 2012, I started my own dance troupe with a little with the little kids. So and we are still dancing because of the pandemic, we cannot carry on. So, but my dance troupe, the music is more from Portugal. Okay, which I, I get it, I download from YouTube and I teach the children. Of course, I try my best to get the local music so that there will be a, a continuation, you know, for these children to learn. And the one dance that I make sure they know is the Branyo. The children, I make sure that they know how to dance the Branyo. And now I'm also I'm teaching them how to sing. I have online classes and I do teach them singing online, like the, especially the Mata Cantiga. You know, we don't have impromptu already. So I give them the words and I ask the boys and the girls to sing. So thank you so much, uh, Margaret, for helping me actually. And now I can explain more to them, you know, when I see them again. Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much. Before we call Professor Nicolo Vito, who has raised his hand, we have a two-part question for Dr. Corosa from our social media pages. First part is, when claims about linguistic appropriations are made, are there generally accepted criteria for saying that an appropriation has taken place? In other words, when does pananakop become pang-aangkin? And what has to happen first? When a Filipino uses Spanish, when his or her use pananakop and when? And the second part is in relation to that one. When the claim is made, the Spanish was appropriated by Filipinos. Is there another kind of paglimot or forgetting? If Spanish is used to resist English, then why not resist Spanish in the first place? 
Dr. Rosa? Hirap naman nun. <laughs> uh, that's too difficult. I, get, I, didn't get, I didn't quite get the first question. Uh, something about uh, when is appropriation? Appropriation. When is it pananakop and when is it pag-aangkin? When does pananakop become pag-aangkin? Mukhang yung siklo po yung oh, hinahanap. Yeah. Yes, yes, actually. Uh, actually, we can look at it in the in the way in the way we look at English right now. No? Uh, we have actually appropriated English also. We, we inangkin na natin yung English. See, that's why we are communicating to each other using English, di ba? And when we use, and actually it is uh, Jimmy Abad who, who I can mention here the poet Jimmy Abad in English who would always say that the Filipinos have already conquered English. And that is why Filipinos are using English in the manner that served their purpose. Diba? Uh, that's, that's the, that was also the situation with the poets then, Balmori and Bernabe, when they used Spanish to resist Americanization. Now, why not resist Spanish first? <laughs> But you see, it happened, and then that, and do na yon. Natatak na sa kasaysayan yon. It happened, and they 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 accepted the language. It's just that uh, with the language now, they can they use the language in uh, pursuing whatever purpose in life they had at the time as Filipinos. So we can't do anything about it because they learned Spanish. See, so. Why not visit Spanish? Actually, both of them, uh, Bernabe and Balmori, they knew they knew the native language. They knew Tagalog. In fact, after 1924 and 1926, between 1926 and 1932, Balmori joined a balagtasan in Tagalog. Would you believe? Bal Jesus Balmori, a famous Spanish poet, uh, joined the balagtasan. He had a bout with, uh, with the uh, Jose Corazon de Jesus, hmm? and uh, they 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 debated poetic. They had a poetic debate in Tagalog. Do you see, he knew Tagalog also. That's why I'm. I'm lagi sinasabi ko nga. Even if they use Spanish, they knew the Tagalog. Kaya nga somehow I can I can I can I can see in I can I can sense in the way they use Spanish. I can sense that they are. Uh, uh, that they are still Tagalog. They are still Filipino using Spanish. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Corosa. Uh, the, uh, the next question is, uh, I don't, uh, I can uh, remember anymore. The second part. You the second part is that one po, regarding uh, why not resist Spanish uh, altogether. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I have, a I have received a comment from our dean, Dr. Jonathan Chihuahua, who mentioned that we might perhaps answer the complexity about language problem and language challenges at another panel taking place on Thursday for yes. the afternoon, which is entitled Language and Identity Formation. Perhaps it's now time for us to listen to Professor Vito's question. He has raised his hand earlier. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for calling on, on me uh, because I wanted to ask two questions. One is directed towards uh, Professor Sarkisian and then the other one is directed to Professor Silvestre. So um, for Professor Sarkisian, I'm very curious about how you were with the people in the communities you observed. I was particularly happy about how uh, phenomenologically deep it was it, you really got into the community and I'm, i was particularly uh pleased with that um i am concerned uh and i saw that when you were interacting with some of the people you were working with it, it seems that you you have a friendship with them so uh, i am thinking in light of ethnographic and ethnomusicological concerns uh because uh, I think in recent times, uh, the notion of participant observation has already been put into question and it has been revisited uh, time and again to, you know, to continue to refine the way we uh, do we other people or is there still an other? 
uh, so are there forms of domination therein? So uh, I, I'm very curious about the way you um, your own method of working and your being with the with the people you were observing with. Um, and if I may ask the question for Professor Sylvester, so that it's it's uh, more uh, I, I, uh, more defined, I guess the the pro progression of the discussion. Uh, I, I was thinking of the piano music that uh, Mampat, that Professor Silvestre had uh, put in, uh, had uh, had us listen to, and I noticed that there were many ornamentations. It's like uh, the, uh, the beats were subdivided into many smaller beats, and then there were uh, there were uh, hindi naman, uh, I'm sorry, there there were uh, I think ornamentations. Uh, but at the same time, the the chord progressions seem the harmonic progressions do not seem to be as uh, sophisticated. And uh, pardon me, I think this is my own limited way of understanding. But I I I was beginning to imagine this as a marker of Filipino piano music during that period because of uh, uh, maybe because of some historical. Uh, details that I might know of, I might not know of yet. Like, for example, the presence of uh, music theory teachers or conservatory teachers at the time. So I I was particularly struck by one uh, chord progression there that sounded like Chopin. That was on the first bar, and then it, 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 it's, it's, there's that very funky sound that that seems to be Chopin. And then suddenly th there are so many uh, complicated uh, arpeggiated passages after that that made me think uh, it's not so much harmonic complexity but rather it's dexterity that was being played with so it's like tricks on the piano uh, and I wonder if that could be justifiably called a mark of Philip uh, it's like Filipinos owning uh, the music of uh, uh, that they have heard or learned from Chopin from Schumann from from Liszt so there, thank you. Thank you to the both of you. Who wants to go? Shall I go uh, first? Yes, oh. yes, ma'am, please. Um, I think that's, Nicola, that, that, that's a, a really um, good question that, that you ask. Um, um, what my relationship is, uh, how people there feel um, about me, you'd have to ask them. I, I, I would never presuppose um, answering that on anybody's behalf, but uh, I'm a musician by, by by training, and I've been uh, doing my research and going to the kampung uh, for 30 years now. Uh, pretty much every year, um, I've missed a couple of years, and obviously I haven't been able to go since 2019 because of the pandemic. But um, but I'm a regular visitor. I play with the group. I play with. Um, um, Malia Malia group now, and I played with um, uh, three of the four active uh, groups in the 1990s, primarily with uh, Papa Joe's uh, San Pedro group and also Tropa di Malacca. So I have a long um, a connection as a musician in, within the group, um, as a, as a as 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 a you know not a leader, but but just one of the rank and file musicians. So. Um, in, and in that capacity, I don't make any, um, uh, I do nothing other than play and be a jamming member of the group. So um, I think most people know me in that capacity and not as a scholar. Um, and I think that is a difference between what I, my work and the work of some people who come in, study and leave and then write, write a lot of books. Um, one of the most important things somebody said to me early in my time in Malacca is, you know, you researchers come here um, and you um, become parts of our families and parts of um, parts of our lives. And then you go away and we don't see you anymore. You, you become like our sister or our daughter and you don't see we, we never see you again. And and it made a big impression on me as a graduate student that um, the old, I couldn't give anything back at that time. I was just a graduate student. Uh, when I started 30 years ago, uh, but what I could do was go back and I've always gone back and I think um, For me, that's the most important connection that I have with the community Perhaps I see things somewhat differently through a different lens than than community members there, but I really try not to um, give my 
uh, opinion um, I, because I am very concerned about the issues of hierarchy uh, there. So um, yeah, that's really all, all, all I can say in answer to your question. You'd have to ask community members uh, um, uh, if you really, if you want to get the dirt on what they think about me. Um, I can't answer that for you, but it's a good point. It's a very good point. Thank you for thank you for raising it. And it's my turn. Uh, thanks for the question, Nico. Um, uh, you're right about Chopin. I, I uh, together with uh, Shades of Schumann and Liz, you know, that that particular piece uh, uh, represents the first, perhaps the first crop of of um, the prototypes of art music that would, as I said earlier, plant the seed for a formal art music tradition in piano that would be founded and nurtured in the College of Music uh, later on. Um, the, those uh, flowery passages that you mentioned, the, yes, that's right. Um, I was thinking um, that could be an influence from vocal music. Um, uh, remember, opera was very popular in Manila and uh, there was a lot of bel canto opera and uh, those coloratura passages um, and uh, uh, people were, you know, this was the, the popular music of the time. And so uh, these uh, kinds of melodies entered the consciousness of, of people and the composers, and they probably, you know, put that out in their piano music as well. And you can also look at it in this way. Um, it, uh, the native wanted, the, the native or the India composer wanted, of course, to showcase his uh, skill in uh, composing for uh, the piano. Uh, of course, uh, this would all taper off eventually and we wouldn't see the same characteristics in, let's say, Nicanora Bellardo's piano music, um, um, which is more subdued in terms of those flowery passages. Um, um, I would say that um, when the native ex excelled in writing piano music, that pointed to a kind of an anti-colonial critique in itself. Thanks, Nico. All right, so we have a couple of more questions, especially from our participants here in the Zoom room. So I guess we can have a round of question and answer for all our panelists. First, for Dr. Silvestre, which I guess is a question on nativeness. It's from Dr. Gary De Villes. He says here, how is the piano able to capture the native musicality? And another one from Dr. Chua. Following the quote from Baba, would you say there was something new that got created from the three examples? Something not quite Spanish and not quite indigenous? In the case of Piano Filipino, for example, what made Filipino not quite Spanish or Swiss or German or whatever, yet not quite native either? Or is it a case of people claiming something foreign as its own instead of a new object being created? Oh. Um. I see something on the chat that says that was already answered. Is, is that it? I guess the, the first part regarding native musicality. Oh, all right. And all the right. other one is from Dr. Chua about ah. a comment on Baba's quote. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. Um, well, something native, something foreign, yes. Uh, yes, something new from something old, uh, something modified from the foreign, I would say, as Margaret mentioned earlier, um, we Filipinos, we claimed uh, the foreign as our own and also uh, shaped it in a way that, you know, actually when, 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 for example, we talk about Sarsuela in my class or Abanera and my students go, really, that was Spanish? All the while I thought it was Filipino. So uh, uh, it never entered there their consciousness that this was a foreign form that uh, we claimed as our own. Um, and there are so many examples, like I listed a few here that I might, um, I could mention, like for example, the habanera um, became the danza filipina and that pattern, the tan, ta, tan, 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 ta, tan, tan, which is so Filipino, uh, is used in so many songs from from the folk songs like at the Ayati Meisangao being in the Ilocos to uh, um, uh, uh, 
Julio Nakpil's uh, piano piece, Recuerdos de Capis, to Harana songs such as O Ilao or Dungawin Mohirang, all these Harana songs, even to, to film music like Maala Ala Mo Kaya, Maala Ala Mo Katatan Tan. Now, what made it, uh, what, how did we make it our own? Perhaps our own a Habanera is a kind more laid back, more tropical, more, more only we can tell what uh, that, that, that distinct uh, Filipino-ness in, in the Habanera, which has been called the Danza Filipina. There's so many examples, um, the Polka Bal, you know, the polka and the balse merge together. That's so Filipino. And um, I, I can also mention the Pastores song from uh, the, the Villancico from Mexico. Uh, in the original meter, it's in triple time. Pastores, Abelen, ah, one, three, one, two, three. But uh, what upon entering Philippine shores, it transforms into this happy duple. And so it has become so native in, in temperament and, and uh, feel and aesthetic. That Now, in terms of uh, the comedia and the, the, the sarsuela and the piano Filipino, you see this also very clearly. Um, the comedia, well, uh, in just by being indigenized in terms of the language has already made it our own. Um, um, I, I want to focus on the music. Uh, um, we have um, the fact that we we use this a hodgepodge of assorted tunes that uh, the Spaniards uh, thought were uh, really illogical, like the Hino de Riego, the hymn of the liberals. Why in the world would it be used as battle music? It's only the Filipino because he liked it and it best suited his taste. Um, and the kumintang and the kundiman or the balitao in, in the comedia, that's what makes it Filipino. In the case of the zarzuela, uh, the moment uh, Praxedes Yeyang Fernandez learned her, uh, her uh, learned the zarzuela from her Spanish mentors and the moment she opens her mouth, it becomes something new already because she approaches the zarzuela as with all her native experience and brings it out. It comes out differently. Uh, in the case of the piano Filipino, this is interesting because the tremolophon or that device that Pio Trinidad uh, inserted into the mechanism produces a uh, tremolo. And the tremolo is a vibrating, uh, trembling effect, sort of, uh, which makes it the tone more, uh, more, uh, uh, expressive, perhaps, and maybe it's because, you know, the saying, as the Department of Tourism always uses it, it's more fun in the Philippines. So they, they wanted a more, uh, a, a more passionate, uh, exciting, expressive sound to suit uh, Filipino taste. So uh, I think, yeah, I, I hope I answered that question adequately. Thank you so much, Dr. Sylvester. Dr. Kurinasa, you turn on your microphone. Would you like to say something? I'm interested in what uh, Patricia is sharing, sharing with us now. And, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lover of music. I could have talked about the Kundiman or the Balitao instead of the Balagtasan of uh, Balmore and Bernabe. Had I known that I'll be part of a, of a, of a panel that uh, where my companions or my co-speakers are both into music, well, I could have... Uh, <laughs> Done something about the kundiman or the balita or the dance of Filipina, yeah. mm. and we could have a, a Patricia could play something that I, I she could accompany me singing uh, a, a dance <laughs> probably or a harana maybe, yeah. <laughs> the O E La O. Sagabi madini. Sagabi malamig. One is muy between salang. <laughs> Songs. And, and I'm happy that I, that our friend who is here now, who is from Malaysia, is uh, telling us that the, the, uh, the ancestors are from the Philippines and that they got the, 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 the love for music from. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes, Dr. Kurinasa, you turn on your microphone. 
Yeah, I just 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 want to add because uh, because you made that uh, referred back to Martin's point, uh, Michael. It, it's an it's an important one. There were a number of musicians, Filipino musicians, who came to Malaysia in the early twentieth century. Uh, mm -hmm. The police band uh, originally they were brought in to be musicians, and these families stayed. Uh, there were some very important families, the Solianos in particular, who mm -hmm. um, were the core, the central part of the Malaysian popular music world. Um, and uh, in fact, Horace Santa Maria, um, who, who I've done a lot of interviewing with over the past years, performed a lot with Solian and, and um, uh, a number of these other musicians. Uh, and not, some of them also ended up settling in Malacca. There were um, um, uh, the uh, I'm completely blanking on names right now, which I had in my head about two seconds ago, but Soliano pushed all the other names out of my head. Um, and Zaza Diaz was, was, was one. Um, and uh, gosh, what's Mona's family name? Um, uh, I, I, I don't remember all of the names now, but there were a number who were, uh, had a Filipino heritage from that wave of musicians who came and settled, and they were very, very important, particularly to the cabaret and the popular music thing, as well as to um, the the the, the communities. That might link with some of your 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 work, uh, actually, in, in in many ways. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you so much to our panelists. So I received a signal that we have already went beyond the time slot. I apologize for that. So allow me to wrap up this engaging talk this evening. I'm sure we can continue this discussion online, especially that we have put up YouTube and Facebook pages for this conference. So that ends our open forum this evening. Thank you so much once again to Dr. Silvestre, Dr. Carosa, and Professor Sertishan for sharing your insights and knowledge. Allow me to share my screen again for some announcement on what is in store for us for the upcoming days. So on Wednesday, July 21 at 7.30 p.m. Philippine time, the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies will host another panel on legacies of the encounter in forms of expression featuring Sandra, Sandra Castro, Dr. Florina H. Capistrano Baker, and Gino Gonzalez. Another panel, as I've mentioned earlier, is taking place on Thursday, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, to be led by the Department of English, and it is the panel on language and identity formation, so please look forward to that. And we also invite you to join us for the closing ceremony this Friday, the 23rd at 4 p.m. Philippine time. We have Ambet Ocampo as our keynote speaker with his presentation entitled Rewind, Fast Forward, Record Delete, Liberating Ourselves from the Past. 500 years. For more information about these upcoming talks and panels, you may visit ateneo.edu slash contacts dash end dash continuities. We hope to see you at those events. In behalf of the Department of Filipino and the School of Humanities of the Ateneo de Manila University and our partners CHAM, Centro de Humanidades, Universidad de Nova de Lisboa, and the National Quincentennial Commission, I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Where was our Christian language? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe we can wait for another one. We didn't get the audience to tweet. <laughs> can we have a photo? Yes. It was a fun photo. Uh,